हेलो हाय वेलकम एवरीबॉडी आई थिंक इंस्टाग्राम इज नाउ सेंडिंग आउट नोटिफिकेशंस टू एवरीबॉडी वी आर लाइव विद हॉट कप ऑफ टी या होल्ड ऑन वी आर टेलिंग योर फॉलोअर्स वी टेलिंग मोर फॉलोअर्स टू जॉइन योर वीडियो या या प्लीज डू आई होप यू डोंट हैव एनी connection issues hi arish how are you good to have you back hi <laughs> hello can give it a couple more minutes for everybody to join in good 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 Arish, it's just you and me right now. <laughs> just wait for everybody else to join in. One minute earlier than the scheduled time. Okay. Okay, Kupai is here. Mike is here. Hi, Ravi. Ravi Paji, how are you? Hello, hello, hello. Hi. Hi, Mike. Just going to get you on. Kupai. Hello. Hey there. How are we doing? Doing great. How are you? Good. Can you hear me? Okay, because it's the first time I've used these yeah. headphones. Yeah. Pieces. Loud and clear. Excellent. Loud and clear. Okay, how's it going? Did you did you have a light lunch as promised? I had a very light lunch. Thank you very much indeed. Yes. Yep. 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 Nothing too major today. <laughs> Obviously, Great, you know, the, yeah. the, the, the pubs are all closed in England still, so you know there goes my normal. Oh yeah. Time. Yeah. 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 Um, we'll give it yeah. another minute for people to join in, and then uh, we'll kick off. Uh, how How's the weather like now, Mike? Is it Cold or is it? No, it's good? been really good. Yesterday we were mid mid twenties, sort of twenty four, twenty five degrees. Um, really sunny yesterday. Today's a little overcast, but um, still warm. It's nice. It's we're starting to head into sort of the proper spring and summer. Um, yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm yeah. virtually no rain for weeks. It's been pretty good. Oh, that's nice. That's nice. That's nice. Yeah, best time to visit the UK, I guess, in June and July. Yeah, yeah, sort of springtime and early summer. I think is is probably my favourite season here. It's uh, it's okay. nice. Everything's just getting green. It's yeah, it's a it's a nice place to be. Great, fantastic. So, Mike, I am going to kick off now with an introduction, and we'll we'll let the others join in slowly. And uh, what we'll do is that we'll take some questions on the way. If you happen to see one question or any question that interests you, hi, look, uh, that interests you, please pick it up and and answer the question right away. Absolutely, most welcome to do that. Okay, my friend. Okay. Okay. Hey, Mihir. Hi, welcome, 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 guys. Welcome, Alok, Mihir, Hokai. Good to have you guys. Okay, so um, a short introduction, which is not really that short. <laughs> for mike um, welcome mike lord uh, mike is the operations director uh, for the motorcycle experience uh, uk and he is also an international he is the international training coordinator for the harley davidson riding academy those are just uh, two of the smallest most current titles that i am introducing uh, mike with at, at this point of time um, mike has over 3 decades of uh, 
rich experience training people to ride motorcycles uh, my kinest team have trained over 100000 new riders uh, over the years probably a little more than that mike you can correct me if i'm wrong there but uh, 60000 riders in, in one stretch uh, through the get on campaign in the uk alone right uh yeah mike uh, uh, as the international training coordinator mike is responsible for uh, developing the course content you know ensuring that the setup for the riding academy is in the respective countries is uh, up to top spec and um, mike also ensures that the right uh, people get the right certification so that they can uh, uh, train other riders as coaches so he is a tough cookie i must say that when it comes to that that one <laughs> 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 I was a pussy cat. Uh, I treated you very gently. Oh, really? Okay. Um I also want to call out that you know Mike um he had a lot of experience working with government bodies across the world developing new uh, motorcycle rider uh, course curriculum in countries like China, Mexico, Brazil, uh, Canada, South Africa, Colombia, Australia and India as well. Um you know such is the the kind of uh, effort that goes in and the kind of uh, experience that mike brings in and value that he brings in that um, one of his programs has led to being the curriculum that is actually the license acquisition in in canada in alberta so that is a phenomenal uh, achievement if you compare that in in indian terms that means that uh, a program that was designed for people to get motorcycle licenses um in india licenses being issued in india and I, once again correct me if i'm wrong here mike but i think that's what i can equate it to yes it is it, it's exactly that it was the opportunity uh when we went into that country we we were given an opportunity to to look at what was already existing to how it works um and we introduced our curriculum showed them what we wanted to achieve and they took it on board and said well okay if if you take this course we'll give you a motorcycle license and it's probably one of the proudest things that, that that we've ever had achieved in the, in the years that we've been doing it absolutely absolutely um and i'm sure uh people who have joined us and the riders who have jo- joined us would know how how difficult it is to get a license in countries outside of india i am not going to make any controversial statements on how easy it is to get one in india <laughs> but it is extremely difficult and uh, it it is a massive accomplishment to have contributed in that significantly um i can go on and on but these are the the, the significant few things that um mike and his team have been able to uh, achieve under his leadership thank you once again mike uh, for joining us it's just post lunch and um, i will try not to put you to sleep yeah <laughs> that's okay you know some of the uh, some of the rest of europe m- may take a siesta but we we're, we're normally okay we'll be okay uh lovely 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 so i just want to welcome again um danny um Akshay, uh, Georgie is on, Mikey. So Georgie is on. You hey, sure. On, <laughs> and I guess a few more of our guys will also join. Is Vikram is here from Nasik, Harshal is here from Pune, Reggie is from Mumbai. Thank you guys for joining. And uh, whenever you have a question, please don't feel afraid to to uh, put in a comment there. Hey Rakesh, hello. Hi. Uh, okay, moving on. Um, 30 plus years in the motorcycling industry um you started off uh, not with training as the uh, the core competency per se but um, you did start in the motorcycling space um and now you are responsible for um developing content training master trainer right so training the trainer and uh, customizing this content to many many countries across the globe um being part of one of the top training organizations in the world when it comes to motorcycling how did this all start off mike it started as a joke if i'm honest <laughs> um it's a really it's a really strange thing and i think the, the more people you talk to in the motorcycle industry you realize that their passion takes them quite a long way um i was in my my early 20s and uh, i've been riding bikes since I was legally allowed to in the UK which was 17 um so mm-hmm. I kind of started on on Honda 125s as a lot of us do here um I got a a license and and started buying Kawasaki's uh that sort of big inline fours were 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 my thing uh 
So I had kind of Z650s and, and then uh, upgraded to like a, a Z1000 Eddie Lawson replica, which was great in a straight line, but you never, ever wanted to try and take it around the corner. It was, was never a good experience. <laughs> Um, and purely by chance, uh, I had taken my, my motorcycle license at a training school in, uh, in Leicester, my hometown. And training in the UK, was, it wasn't in an infant state, but it was still very much an enthusiast's market. Um, right. You know, you, you had kind of guys doing it on a Saturday morning for a bit of fun. And, and, but it was just at that climb with legislation the way it is, and, and I don't know if, you, if, if the guys watching will, will know the differences, but you know, in the UK, we've always had a lot of legislation where training is concerned, and we've had this need to take you know, coordinated training and testing run by the government. Um, right. So we were still in this amateur era, and a, a very close friend of mine had booked himself onto a training course, uh, the same training school where I had taken my test. And mm -hmm. he was working full time, as was I. And he asked me if I could go down there one, one, one of my days off and just pay, pay for this training for him so it was all secured. Yeah. And I, I walked into a training school and uh, this place had, had, was nothing like I'd seen before. They had a line of about 40, one, two, well, actually Yamaha RX 100 motorcycles, all brand new. This place had proper office facilities. It had toilet facilities. It had flowers, you know, around the, the training area. It was... It was on a different level to anything that I'd said. And I got talking to, to the guy behind the counter, um, having a bit of a laugh with him about bikes and what, what we rode. And, and at the time, I, I had a full-time job. I was a graphic artist. I, I had no intention of changing what I was doing. And uh, kind of jokingly, after I'd been there for about an hour, I, I said to him, so uh, have you got any jobs? You know, how, how do you get a job here doing this, riding motorcycle? <laughs> And this guy looked at me, and I didn't realize at the time he owned this whole group of motorcycle training schools. It was a company called CSM. Um, uh -huh. became the biggest training school in the UK uh, for a long, long time. And this guy looked at me, and he was kind of like, hmm, are you interested in full-time or part-time? And I was genuinely taken aback. I, I was kind of like, well, you know, you don't, you don't get paid for this. No, nobody <laughs> is, nobody's dumb enough to pay you to ride a motorcycle all day. So I thought, well, you, you, you can't live on this. So I, I kind of, I was a little bit flustered because I didn't expect it. And I said, well, um, uh, part-time. And, and he said, uh, well, um, come in this weekend, observe a course, come as a student, pretend you've done, not got a license, see what you think. And if you enjoy it, we'll talk on Monday morning. And I loved it. It, it was, uh, it's kind of, it's hard to explain. It was almost that feeling of coming home. I was in an environment, uh -huh. and, and as you, you will tell, you know already, Sam, that I can talk. I, I, I enjoy talking. Uh, I enjoy communicating. Um, and, and that ability in a motorcycle world was, was a dream come true. So I, I, I started doing some part-time work. Um, they taught me their curriculum. And uh, three months later, they phoned me up and said, do you want to give up what you're doing and come and work for us full time? And that was 30 years ago. And I've, I've not looked back. You, you know, I, I started there as an instructor, uh, just on the ground, just, just training people. And, and I, if I'm honest, Sam, even now, I wake up every day of my working life and, and I cannot believe that people are stupid enough to pay me for what I do for a living. <laughs> <laughs> Ugh. Yeah, it's a it's a privilege. It, it is a it's a privilege and an honour, uh, you know, for the people I meet and, and what I've had what I've had the opportunity to do. It's great and and it's fun, but you have to be an enthusiast. You've got to stay passionate. Absolutely, 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 absolutely. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Thank you, thank you for sharing that with us, Mike. Um, I, the uh, in the UK, you would need a, a separate license to ride a motorcycle over five hundred cc or is a certain cc. Yeah, we have a, a tiered license system, um, which, which can be quite detrimental to the industry at times. Um, in true English style, we gold plate any legislation. Uh, we, we make it more difficult than we need to. So to ride any machine uh, uh, up to 125cc, you have to take a, a full day's training, uh, something called compulsory basic training. It is actually, you would look at, with the training that, that we gave to you guys, 
um, you would you would recognize a lot of that curriculum. You know, we used yeah. the European model when we built the, the Ryden Academy for Harley Davidson. So you yeah. take a day's training. That that is most of it is is skilled training on the on the training area. Um, but it, you legally have to take two hours training on the road, and that is before mm-hmm. you are allowed to ride anything. And then you can ride up to one two five on L plates. It depends varies okay. depending on an age. You then have to take a theory test, so a written test. You then have to take a, a two-part practical test. The first part being about 20 minutes at, at much higher speeds with all, all the skills. Um, normally, on, on they're just changing it to kind of a 250cc law to ride a mid-range bike or kind of about a sort of 650cc if you want to ride a heavyweight motorcycle. Yeah. And then you have to take the final part of the test, which is on the road. And you are followed by an examiner radio link between him and you very much one-to-one okay. and he will follow you give you directions and if you get it wrong you try again and you fail and come back another day but if you get it right you you get your license and as long as you're over 24 years old you get an unlimited license so it is okay. it's quite that's kind of a background of, of, of the confines of the barriers in which we we have to work um right i'm i'm, I'm part of that was dumbing that down to an extent so that it was common sense when we took it out to international markets, because it's too convoluted. It, it's too yeah. stringent. True, true, true. Okay, through the, uh, welcome again. I'm going to keep welcoming people as they join us. Rakesh, Vinay, Prajit, Vinay. Bombay Harriers have joined us. One of the oldest Kali motorcycle clubs in, uh, in the country. Welcome, cool. guys. Uh, okay. Um, how, how many countries have you trained in by now, Mike? So uh, something that. So, uh, well, I mean, it's, it's worth to, uh, sort of seven, seven and a half years ago. Um, we got a, I got a phone call out of the blue uh, from an old colleague of ours who now works for Harley Davidson. Um, it's worth just touching on on how it came about. We, yeah, I'd, I'd been involved quite a lot in UK legislation, in training structures, you know, talking to the government here. Um, yeah, I, I was quite opinionated in, in training standards and, a, and a voiced, had the opportunity to voice those opinions publicly at times. And the phone yeah. rang and, and it was a guy I hadn't spoken to for a few years. Turned out he was working for, for Harley Davidson out in the Far East. He was looking after China and lots of other countries. Huh. And Harley had decided they, they wanted an international model to go and train people in, in a developing market. Certainly those markets yeah. that don't have an intrinsic um, motorcycle heavyweight motorcycle culture and yeah. he said well you know basically he said mike you've got a big gob you've got a big mouth um <laughs> can, can you it's pretty much how the conversation went um could i write a curriculum to train people on harley davidson and of course you know you you sit there and you go yeah yeah no problems at all man and then you put the phone down i phoned my business partner a guy called nick um, we've worked together for many, many years and told him and we kind of then sat there and realized what we said yes to. So we, we had to pitch. We, we pitched against some very, very big companies but, and also a lot of American training organizations because yeah. they, they were quite keen to keep it in-house. But we pitched at a European level and were successful. So for seven years, we started out, to answer your original question, we started out with South Africa, Mexico and China. We subsequently went into uh, Australia and Brazil, uh, Canada and Colombia. Um, wow. Obviously, we, we, we're hitting and, and, and start just entering into the market in India, which is one of the most exciting projects uh, for, for so many reasons, which I'm sure we'll touch on. Um, oh yeah, I think that's it at the moment. Uh, obviously, we, we did a, some training out of the, the States, that they have their own laws. Um, yeah. You know, they different training culture there as well as doing what we still do in the UK. So yeah, we, we, we traveled a lot. Yeah, yeah. And one of the things I, that I remember you saying is that you like traveling a lot. So uh, motorcycling and traveling couldn't be a better combination than that. <laughs> when, I joke, when, when, when people ask me what I do for a living who don't know me, you know, I, I kind of sit there and, and some, somewhat out of truth, somewhat blase, I say, you know, I, I fly around the world and ride Harley Davidson. And there is still nothing wrong with that conversation, you know. 
that, that statement to himself. <laughs> That'll do. Yeah. Yeah, why not? Living the dream. That's nice. A little bit. Uh, <laughs> right. Um, so you talked about, you know, pretty much across the globe. Um, I'm sure the conditions were different everywhere. The cultures are different everywhere. Uh, yeah. Language barriers can be a big, big problem at certain times. What, which, which uh, region has been the most challenging and which one has been the easiest, if you can, if you can call those out. And why, why did you think that they were the easiest okay. or the most difficult? I'll start by saying that I thought India was going to be a lot more challenging than it was. But we'll, again, we'll come on to India as a separate subject, I think, because it, it is unique in so many ways. Um, it, it is the, the most difficult culturally and language wise with China. Um, that was a, a very strange environment to be in because it was one of the first countries we went into. We were, yeah. we were kind of testing our, our, our theory as well. And the language is so far removed from, from anything, you know, Western, from our point of view. The yeah. culture is so far yeah. removed. And we were, we were warned about, it, you know, all of the things that you get warned about when you go to somewhere like China, you know, culturally how you should behave. Um, you know, you've got to be very careful about respect and, and how you deal with things. Um, so are you frozen? Are you still there? Come back. Come back. Ah, there we go. Yeah, I'm sorry. I think there's some, there's been some connectivity issues last couple of days, I guess. Yeah. No, yeah. no, no. What it really <laughs> yeah. was is, is I, I, I mentioned China, and, and it obviously decided to freeze me out just in case I said anything I shouldn't. <laughs> Danny says, "Welcome to the Indian network." <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it, sure. it, it, it isn't usually this bad. It's just been a couple of days. I think there, there are too many people on the net not working. I guess. Yeah. Yeah, we have the same thing here. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, I was saying that uh, China was China was the most challenging. Um, the the great thing, it, it's a difficult situation to try to train new coaches using a translator. Uh, certainly, a translator yeah. that doesn't understand motorcycle, because we use a lot of right. terminology that, that that doesn't translate well sometimes. So we. What we try to do is we always try to recruit somebody in country who is bilingual. Um, in yeah. China, it's a guy called Alex. He's been with us for seven years. Um, so effectively, I, I would train him. I would then observe him training others in the native language. Yeah. And it's interesting because you soon learn that no matter what words are being spoken, you can relate to his body language. How does he react to the customer, whether the customer is listening to what is being told and whether yeah. the main aim, as, as you'll appreciate when we did training, is the fault correction. Is, is he actually picking up? So it doesn't matter on the actual words being used. It's how the interaction works. It, it, it ten, 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 tends to be how we do it. Yeah, yeah. Fair enough, fair enough, fair enough. Absolutely. Um, and I, which one was the easiest? I'm then? sorry, I've just seen that question. I, to I totally... I totally agree about the, the forward-facing cameras. 
um, certainly at night, you know, you're riding along and, and a camera will flash into your face. It, it, it is quite disconcerting. Yeah. Not a clever idea. Yeah. Thanks, Mir, for that question. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how people manage, but yeah, that's what it is. So I, I have not been to China, so I don't know exactly what he's talking about, but you would. Um, which one has been your easiest territory so far? I think, do you want easiest or do you want most pleasurable, I guess? Because uh, the two things are different. I think uh, the, the easiest, because they have already had a culture uh, of training, was, was Canada. Even though right. we had developed a course for license acquisition and, and legally there was a lot more at stake. Um, there were no language issues. There was very much a culture um, uh, which was similar, I guess, to the UK. You've frozen again. Let's see. Oh, sorry about that. There we go. It's just a bad day, I guess. Anyway, so you were saying uh, Canada. Yeah, I, I think uh, you know, Canada, because culturally, they, there's a lot to do with uh, the UK. There's no language yeah. problems. They, they understood formal training. You know, regardless of us going in there, they already had a formal network of training operations. So yeah. there was an understanding that you had to take training and take a, a, a test prior to getting your license. So, um, and also the, the guys there were, were great company. You, you know, um, I think until I came out to, to India, it was one of the best courses I ran. We had a lot of fun. Um, I spent a few uh, more time out there. I've been out there three times. Um, so you get to know your guys really well and you get to see part of a beautiful country as well. So yeah, yeah. I would say so. Great, thank you. Thank you for including us in there. <laughs> no. uh, we'll come on. We'll come on to India separately because you know I've got a soft spot for it. Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, Georgie has a question: How hard was it to write the manual? Is it always a different approach for manuals for different types of motorcycling? Yeah, it's a really it's a really interesting question, Georgie. Um, at first, it was daunting. Um, I, as far as I know, nobody had ever written, uh, you know, a manual from start to finish on how to teach somebody to be to be to ride a motorcycle. You know, not only not only did we have to write the coach manual, we had to write a train the coach manual as well. So everything that I used when I was out there training you guys is written into a separate manual. Mm -hmm. We ha and we had to write it in a manner that meant it could be transported globally. So we had to take into account a very neutral approach to it. Um, I don't think we got it as well as it needed to be. You guys have got the second version. The first version, I think, was, in hindsight, quite, quite patronizing. The second mm. version that you guys have um, is more factual. Every time I read it, I find fault. Um, but it was, uh, to start with, we had to build a framework. So we, we built a structure of what the course should look like. Yeah. We then built an introduction to it, which, which kind of set out our aims and ambitions of what we wanted to achieve with it, and then filled in the detail. Um, and it was probably the first time around, three, three to four months task, really, with, with writing and rewriting, um, and then design and everything else. But we're, we're, I think we're, we're quite proud of what we've got in the end, uh, but it's not yeah. perfect. Yeah, absolutely. I'm sure, you know, like everything, there's always an opportunity to tweak that a little bit. 
from time to time so yeah i'm sure but okay great i'm i'm going to come to a question which i'm sure a lot of riders are going to be interested in and uh, i want your perspective on this so what what do you think uh, is the most important thing required to be a good rider conditions regardless two things i would say uh, attitude and observation um observation comes fire to everything because you know in observation you've got to include you know accepting and understanding what could happen yeah. but your attitude affects first of all how you got to the position you're in but also how you react to what you observe so but but if if it was if i could had to choose one thing it would always be observation you know skills can be taught um yeah. observation is something that that you have to have you have to have the right attitude to to be able to to understand what is going on around you um and and how that affects both culturally and 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 then how you implement the best strategy for what you're seeing in front of you <laughs> okay i understand so um is there a way to you know sometimes it's uh, ingrained in you and sometimes you need to develop that so is there a way for somebody to develop that yeah. the right attitude yeah yeah i i think I think if if I'm honest Sam you know you you and and Georgie and and the other guys that, that were on the the instructor and my, on the coach candidate class you know um in Mumbai will will know that everybody can learn something from from everybody yeah. around us um it, it is one of those situations where we all naturally as most scientists we all think we're the best at what we can do um it's interesting when you get a third part of you and i don't necessarily always mean you know a qualified coach it helps somebody yeah. who is trained to observe and correct fault or or to give ideas but but a, a, anybody's view will make you think um a thinking mode scientist is always going to be a you know a, be a better than say the rider if you've yeah. got that ability to for somebody to look at you and say actually you know i notice the way you you're going around a bend i i notice where you position your body sometimes it's a good thing sometimes it's a bad thing you know yeah. um sometimes it can be a negative sometimes it can be a positive where people can sit there and say you know i i was following you through that series of bends and the way you took the lines was incredible and i was trying to follow you positive learning experience sometimes yeah. it is i was watching the way you took those lines and I'm amazed you're still alive now <laughs> you know <laughs> um yeah so yeah for, formal formal training will, will will always help even yeah. if even if you can't learn anything from the person in front of you if that person makes you think about your riding for the first time in years then it has yeah. achieved its end goal effectively that that's how I'd always view it okay well sir well sir perfect thank you um i'm going to go to one question where you know we uh, a lot of us ride harleys there are a lot of uh, guys on the, who are viewing us and are you know ride advs and adventure tourers and off roaders and all that but uh as the boys who ride harley generally tend to be on the heavier side a little bit right so uh, my question is <laughs> how important do you think physical fitness is and how important uh, mental strength is to be a good rider um and what do you think uh, we should do to get there interesting question um I would counter it with a with a question in return which which is kind of it depends what sort of riding you're doing you know as, as yeah. to what you're looking at doing but you know all of the different you know sort of styles of bikes are built for different kind of riders you know I I I used to ride big inline fours you know very fast I don't like that riding position any longer you know I'm yeah. I'm more comfortable on a cruiser um so physical fitness plays a part because if the more fatigued you become the less you concentrate the less you observe the more you sure. go on to autopilot and and same with mental strength you know if your mind is elsewhere then yeah. you are not paying attention to what is happening around you now you know in somewhere you know in india you've got a lot of natural instinct about what is around you because of the road conditions yeah in in other countries of you know in the uk 
we rely on other people to keep us safe. It's quite an interesting scenario, and the same in a lot of Western countries. We rely on mutual respect to keep us. You know, we trust everybody else with our safety, which is probably yeah, really dangerous. To, really dangerous position to put ourselves in, really. Um, especially when you meet some of the, the people I meet. Um, <laughs> but um, so it, it has an impact, but I don't think it is is as is critical as some people would like to make, because it depends, you've got to understand who you are as an individual as to what sort of yeah. riding you want to do. You know, a yeah. big guy on a Harley who, who's riding freeways, what the hell? You know, stick, yeah. stick that same guy on an adventure sports bike, you know, looking to, to, to head into the Himalayas, whole different game, you know? I'm the same with mental Absolutely. strength. Um, the, the more you're going to push your limits, the more you've got to be on your game, effectively. Fair, fair point, fair point. I'm, I'm going to interrupt you with a question from Jason. Jason is asking us, how is body weight important to ride an ADV? And generally, when we talk about ADVs here, we are talking about the big big bikes here, the, the BMs, the GS1200s, the Tigers, the, the Multistradas, um, and so on. It's an interesting situation that, that it's not necessarily about body size, it's about agility. I, I mean, I, I, we get asked, you know, one of the crucial questions we asked when we first came into the Harley thing was, you know, whether or not we could train somebody on a heavyweight motorcycle. Yeah. My initial instinct was, oh, you know, you've got to start off with getting the skill set there on a small capacity machine until we actually went out there, Sam, and did it. Yeah. And, and my standard answer now is, you know, a motorcycle is, is, is they all weigh the same when they're moving. And the same yeah. with the, the, you know, the weight of the individual on it. If, if that person has the agility, Certainly at slower speeds, to, to shift their body weight a little bit, to counter out what the machine is doing, I don't see it as being a major issue in any way at all. It has an impact, but, it, but it, the only way I can foresee it having a huge impact is if you suddenly put a massive amount of weight onto a motorcycle, which you weren't used to. We all yeah. learn to ride with, with what we're given. And, and, and you know, some, some of us are heavier, you know, uh, certainly after the sort of bank holidays and Christmas, I am. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, and, it, and it changes, it doesn't change the way you ride that motorcycle. So yeah. if you are looking at shifting your body weight to, to help you corner, you're only shifting what you're used to shifting, if that makes sense. Right. You know? Yeah, so, I get you. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't think it makes a massive difference. Right. Fair enough. Can you take a follow-up question, Mike? Yeah. One more? On. Yeah. Um, we have Delano Furtado who is asking us, when do you stand up and ride um, on an ADV, it's a, he's saying GS 1200 specifically. Is yep. it for some specific terrains only and avoidable when riding fast on tarmac? Okay, uh, so as far as standing on the pegs, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of a diplomatic way of putting this. Riding, riding off road then you know, standing on the pegs is there to, to, to give a, a separate level of, of uh, suspension, effectively, using your legs and your knees to, to counteract the, the movement of the machine under you, very much like riding a horse. Yeah. If you're riding on rough terrain, you know, on, on a, uh, an unmade road, there is still an ability to do it. And, and we, don't, we didn't introduce it in the course in India, but we do a, you know, a, um, a kind of a rough terrain lesson plan. Under normal circumstances, on normal tarmac, I actually don't see a, a, a lot of reason for it at all. Um, you, you're gaining nothing. Certainly at speed, uh, I wouldn't be doing it. At slow speed, you may gain a certain amount more balance because you, you've got that ability to counterbalance more because you're adding the extra height to the machine yeah. and using your body yeah. weight. But other than that, it is, uh, it's an off-road technique that, that I think is being adopted at times for show as opposed to for any practical need. Fair enough, fair enough, fair enough. I think um, we got perspective on two things uh, on this, a very different perspective. We've spoken to other people who ride motorcycles. I've been riding motorcycles. I think one of the things that you talked about was agility, right? I think that's, uh, that's a brilliant perspective to have. I think that's very much a fact, you know, it doesn't matter how big you are, if you're quick enough to be able to get yourself in the right position. I think that, yeah. that's, a, the, that's a fantastic uh, view, viewpoint that I think all of us are going to take away with us. Uh, 
we'll keep getting questions but um i am going to come back to question jason i am going to come back to your question later but uh, you mentioned india just before that so you were recently in india last year how did you like it and i will complete my question here uh, what did you think about our traffic which i'm sure people want to know and do you think we have an inherent advantage when it comes to hazard avoidance you see the, the This is a leading question because you know that my <laughs> my, my views on this. Um, it's funny. So I'm I'm going to tie it into a question somebody asked earlier about what is what is one of my my most pleasurable experiences with, with what yeah. I do. Um, if I'm brutally honest, uh, and and please don't lynch me for this, it, it's not the motorcycles to me um, any longer after 30 years. The motorcycles are what bring us all together. It's yeah. the people. But, but but it's the most pleasurable thing for me. Uh, we all ha- we all have a shared interest and a shared passion. So that yeah. ability to interact with people who have a shared passion is is the most pleasurable thing. Yeah. As far as India goes, as you know, well, I don't know, I don't know if I ever mentioned it. I I wasn't looking forward to coming out to India. Um, you know, I, I get to travel and it's a it's a beautiful thing to do. Um, but I've I've also got. A, a beautiful wife and two children here and and you know I miss them a huge amount when I come out of country especially of course some places some places I'm out you know 16 17 days at a time yeah so i i came into india with some preconceived ideas um I, I, we discussed when i was with you you know i i come from a very multicultural city in england um you know leicester has a massive indian population yeah. so i kind of had grown up you know we celebrated diwali you know in the city i was in um so i came out with some preconceived ideas not at all positive i have to say and absolutely loved what i experienced the 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 people the attitude um the generosity of spirit the 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 generosity and and the lack of space when driving vehicles was quite an experience <laughs> um but whether or not you have an inherent ability yeah you do interestingly um you mexico was the same brazil to a slightly lesser extent yeah i would have put i would put any rider in india up against a rider in the middle of london in the middle of birmingham in the middle of leicester in the uk right because we as i said earlier we trust people with our safety yeah you guys cannot afford to do that So 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 your safety is entirely in your hands and that makes you far more aware as a rider and and probably as a driver uh than, than we are naturally and it's a very interesting space and, and something to observe and a little bit frightening uh you know Georgie's just just you know when when you're in a cab in the middle of Mumbai that, that starts reversing down a major road you know at speed I've never experienced anything like that in my life man. um <laughs> You, you know when when even the locals that you're with are hanging on to the seats you start saying they're thinking if you're scared i need to be real <laughs> so so just for people who are who have tuned in uh, to give you a background of what mike is talking about he was in gurgaon with a bunch of our guys in um, in a in a car i think in an suv or something of the sort and uh, i believe you missed missed an exit or an entry or something of the sort uh on on uh, what was a, a highway and you know the driver didn't flinch just put the car in reverse and uh reversed all the way back to the exit point <laughs> that's what that's what mike was talking about you got a flavor of like a james bond flavor of somebody reversing their car in oncoming traffic i think that there was also yeah i was going to say i mean I, it, although you know, after saying all of that I, I, next time I'm out, I, I do want to ride. You, you know, I want to ride some of the cities purely because I, th- I think it is an opportunity to test yourself in that environment. Yeah, It's, yeah, yeah, absolutely. We'll we'll uh, we'll make a kind of a cordon around you when you're riding, a moving caravan sort of a thing. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, uh, yeah, yeah, honestly, uh, Mike, we've had uh, experiences of people from other countries who have ridden here, and. Um, you know like freddy says there are people riding on the wrong side of the highway so freddy is also um had a few friends come over from uh, 
uh, from the US or the UK or, or or South Africa for that matter. And you know, on on a regular road or a five six hundred kilometer journey from Mumbai to Goa, we wouldn't be so hassled. But the person who's joined us was totally terrified by the end of it, mentally exhausted, and we would wonder what's happened. You know, this I know it's a tough ride physically, mentally, but we wouldn't be terrified of it. We are so used to people uh, crossing the road, cattle crossing the road, uh, cars going in uh, in um, you know different directions, coming in the opposite side of the road. I guess it's getting better over a period of time, but yes, we are we are quite a bit far away from being in the ideal situation. So yeah, until that happens, I think we will still have uh, better reflexes than most other countries. Uh, that think, also uh, happened uh, to uh, yeah. No, I was just going to say. I mean, I, I think for, from a, a personal view. You know, I've had I've had conversations many years ago with, with the Indian government about introducing training, and obviously, the riding academy for Harley is a route into market. Um, yeah. My advice to a bunch of you know to, to a group of enthusiasts is just be careful what people wish for as well. You know, yeah. I think India would be a better place if training was more available. But what you can find is when training is legislated, when it becomes law, uh, it becomes a barrier to, to riding two wheels. And you see a massive decline in the market. So, yeah. uh, you know, I, I think it would be important and, and the country would benefit from an opportunity to learn more. Yeah. But, you know, when it becomes legislation, it can be very damning. True. True, true. Absolutely. I think um, there's, a, there's a fair distance for us to go when it comes to uh, drawing segments between the, the capacity or the, uh, of the motorcycle that we are Riding at this point of time, we just have a generic license that we have. Um, but apart from that, I think there is a fair way for us to go in getting to that situation. Maybe we will at some stage. And I think it's very much required for a country like India, given um, how, you know, unfortunately, the number of accidents that we have seen on the road. Yeah. Um, so very, very different environment. And I guess that requires for some uh, customization of um, certain elements when you're riding, you know, just purely... Um, like hazard avoidance will be a big, 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 absolute massive part of that uh, curriculum because that's what you're going to do in 100 kilometers. You're, you're going to have 20 times when you have to really make a decision on which direction to go, whether to brake, whether to accelerate. Uh, it's, it's extremely tough riding on, on the highways here as well. Um, I think, uh, the, the, was that your funniest moment, by the way, Mike? The one in your reverse in the, the James Bond reverse in the, in the SUV? Um, yeah, I, I think whether that was, you know, that that, that was the most funny. My, my my funniest moments are also probably my most frightening moments. Really, you know, they're, they're the ones that make the good pub stories. Uh, yeah, you know, the ones that you can tell your friends and they look at you to, to decide whether or not you're actually telling the truth. I think re reversing in the taxi was one. Um, Mexico. Uh, it was a really interesting country, and, and I've been there many times now. That that was probably the most entertaining story. Was was uh, we were we were stood on one of the training ranges in in Mexico, a place called Cuenavaca. Um, be, before I went out there, I wish I'd googled it because Cuenavaca is famous for the drug dealers hanging the population for, from in, in the underground to stop them talking to the police. You know that was kind of a normal Monday morning. You know it, it's a it's a very very dangerous place and I didn't know this you know <laughs> so I, I went out there and, and I was I was training these guys having a really good time and um, do you know that feeling where, where the whole atmosphere suddenly suddenly dips down you know everybody, Drops, was, yeah. everybody was really energized and then suddenly it went kind of very quiet and everybody was a little bit edgy and uh, I sort of said you know what, what's you know is everything okay guys you know I'm very aware of I've done something culturally you know what has happened and they said oh look don't look now Mike but 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 in the far corner there's a, a BMW car parked up and um, there's some bad men and I'm kind of yeah, I'm British you know what, what do you mean by bad men you know what using offensive language you know and so I said well what, you know what, what do you mean by bad men and they said look look you're just just bad men so you're always going to look. When somebody says, don't look, you're always going to look. Yeah. yeah. So, so I sat on this bike and I kind of adjusted the mirror. And sure enough, there's two guys there, you know, vests on. And these guys have got guns, you know, literally on display. And I'm like, okay, that, that's interesting. 
so I kind of said, look, um, okay, what do we do? And they said, well, you know, we're going to have to be very careful. I said, well, you know, why are they here? And they said, well, they, they could be here to do a drug deal. Um, and if they are, we don't want to witness it. You, you don't want to be here because you become a witness to a federal crime. So I'm kind of like, yeah, okay. They said, well, they, they could be here to meet somebody just to, you know, as bodyguards. Uh, and, and, you know, then they'll come and they'll just go and everything will be fine. Uh, they could be here to, to steal a vehicle. And, and if that's going to happen, we should just let it, let it go. Because these guys who were trainee coaches, they have some nice cars and stuff as well. You know, the big American 4x4s and stuff. So I'm like, yeah. And then this guy looks me in the face and he said, oh, oh they're here for you. Holy and, I'm kind of, and I'm kind of, what do you mean? And they said, well, you know, best respect in the world, Mark. You, you're obviously a gringo. And you work for Harley <laughs> Davidson. You know, basically, you are, you are high value kidnap material. And you're sitting there going, well, <laughs> okay, man, where, where'd you go now? Whoa. And they sort of say, they said, well, I said, well, what do we do? And they said, well, we, we all get in one vehicle and we all leave together. And we go, and if they follow us, we have to find the army. And I said, well, do we not find the police? And they said, no, no here, the police would know about it and they'll be involved. Holy crap. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we, we literally, we, we piled in a minibus and, and we left and they stayed where they were, thankfully. And we drove across oh. the other side of a freeway. And, and we looked wow. down and about 20 minutes later, um, a, a young girl turned up in a Porsche and they were there to escort. She was a, probably the girlfriend or, or the wife of, of the, 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 you know, the, the drug dealers, the mafia. Wow. And, uh, and they then left. But that, that was probably one of the moments where you're sitting there thinking, do you know, I've got a great job, but I'm not being paid <laughs> enough for this. <laughs> that was something, man. That was something. Amazing, amazing, amazing. All right. Uh, I'm going. To, I'm going to take one question, Mike. We have question. Uh, we have time for one question, Jason. Sorry, I will. Uh, we will answer a question offline. Very, very valid question. But I'm going to take Anuj's question. One. Uh, what is the difference you feel in solo and riding in groups? Many of us ride solo. Any pointers there? Yeah, for That's sure. Anuj, just uh, to I'm, ask. For, uh, interestingly, I think as, as we as we grow into the Indian market, we have a, a, a group riding curriculum. And it, it, and it very much concentrates on what I was saying before about um, in India, particularly, you are responsible for your own safety. Yeah. That changes dynamic when you're riding in a group. Your, yeah, your, your own riding style has to remain the same, but you've got to be aware of everybody around you. But the one thing I'm not a great fan of, uh, and it's very much an American thing, is this desire when riding in groups for, for, for massive arm signals, you, you know, like I'm turning right, I'm turning left. I need some fuel. You know, this guy's mad. You know, look at what that guy <laughs> did to you. You know, all of yeah. these things. The curriculum that we've worked on basically still relies on the individual's ability to ride a bike as they would yeah. do when riding solo. Yeah. But to ride it in an environment where you've got to be aware of what is around you and to pay respect. So it is things like, you know, you don't overtake in a group ride because yeah. it's not expected. But you also should not expect the person in front of you to be looking after your safety. You know, you yeah. shouldn't need somebody to tell you that, 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 that there's gravel on the road or there's a massive yeah. pothole. Or, you know, you should be aware enough. So it is about how you ride in that environment. Keep the group mentality there while still taking responsibility for your own safety. Um, yeah. But it's, it's quite an interesting subject and one that I'd love to have a longer conversation about because, as I say, we've, sure. we've just re-evaluated re our curriculum on it. Um, it is predominantly for, for things you know, like the American and the UK markets, so it would need adaptation for the Indian market, but it would be an interesting project to do. Sure. sure. Maybe we can invite some of the guys uh, on another call later, sometime in a couple of weeks, uh, where we have a couple of people who have ridden a few thousand kilometers and I intend to get a few people on board who have ridden about 100,000, 200,000 kilometers um, and, you know, get their take on this and share some insights from them, which are very, very peculiar to India. And maybe that's something that you can use as well. Yeah, great. Um, I, we have eight minutes. I'm going to go through the trivia section really, really quickly. So are you ready? Uh, go on. All right. Question one. World's fastest production motorcycle. Simple one, because I love that brand as well. 
and actually work, <laughs> we'll do work for them in the UK. As production wise, it's going to be the Kawasaki. Um, started with started initially with with the production of the GPZ and ZZRs, but now is at the ultimate. And I've not ridden one actually, but would love to, which is, is the H2R, which is a phenomenal piece of kit. Spot on, spot on. 249 miles per hour, 400 kilometers per hour. Right. Don't know where you'll ride that, but phenomenal. Okay. Crazy. Um, this one also should be relatively easy for you. Question number two. What motorcycling company also makes space rockets? I think they just put wings on the H2R, didn't they? <laughs> True. That's yeah. right. It's Kawasaki same, same, again. Same technology, Good I think. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I think they've, they've kind of uh, done that uh, run on the tarmac against the plane also, I think. If I'm not wrong in one of the YouTube videos. Yeah. That's just, just absolutely crazy. Okay. Number three. Uh, which motorcycling brand started off as a piano manufacturer? Going to be in Japan and it's going to be Yamaha. Absolutely spot on. Um, as motorcycle enthusiasts, I... Did not know that Yamaha makes musical instruments at all. At I begin only with. do <laughs> because my brother, is, my brother is what we affectionately call a muso. Some of other oh. played instruments and, and loves his music, and that's the only reason I would know. Oh, okay, cool, cool, cool. Very nice. Um, question number four: Maximum number of superbike world champion wins. Nah, you, I, I'm, I'm gonna own up to this one and go. You see, racing's not my thing. I think. Uh, from a, you know, apart from stuff like the TT, I don't tend to follow the race series very much in, in, around the world. Um, it comes from, I've, I've ridden track a few times and it just doesn't suit me. You know, kind of doing real observations before going into a hairpin never works very well. <laughs> I, I've, I've been too, too embedded in safety for too long. Got it. So I'll, I'll give you that answer. It's Jonathan Ray, 2015 through 2019. Cool. Okay. Um, number five, we've got, I'm keeping an eye out here, five minutes to go. So I'm going to make this okay. quick. Who has the most wins, uh, on the Isle of Man TT? Joey Dunlop. Legend. Ah, yeah, absolutely. 26 Legend. wins. That is just phenomenal. Yeah. Uh, that. Yeah. From 77 to 2026 wins in, in, uh, what is actu factually the most dangerous race in the world on two wheels, I believe. I've, I've ridden the um, circuit. I have ridden the circuit. Oh, you have? Once. Oh, yeah, okay. On, on a, uh, funny enough, on a GP bike, but um, that was a... Oh, yeah. 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 That's Japan. just crazy. Oh, but yeah, slowly. Amazing. Uh, very, very slowly. <laughs> <laughs> nice, nice, nice. Okay. Number six. What world-leading helmet company started off as a hat manufacturer? It's going to be Shoei or Ally. Ally. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You got that right. It's Sarai. Very nice. Uh, five out of six. Moving on to the seventh one. When did Harley Davidson first start selling sidecars to go along with its bikes? I will give you four options. Okay. Uh, 19, 1901, 1914, 1939, 1955. Okay. But that's how cycles joined the Second World War. So if that was... So I can't imagine that they developed them four, Ben. 1914. Perfect. Absolutely. Absolutely. Six out of seven. Question number eight. This is very easy. Which city in the American Midwest is home to the Harley Davidson Museum? Do you need any options? or Milwaukee. Wonderful. Oh. If anybody gets the opportunity, wonderful place. And there's a, will... a Harley Davidson themed hotel next door. Oh, really? Nice. Yeah. yeah. Got, got to plan that. Okay, next one. Which of these words is not part of the motorcycle safety training acronym S I P D E. Which one is not part of this? Scan A is scan B is initiate C is predict D is decide. B initiate. Yeah, spot on, spot on, spot. I am rushing only because we are almost no, run no. out of time. Yeah. Uh, question number ten. Which of these actors did not star as a biker in the nineteen sixty nine classic road film Easy Rider? I just watched it last week. How old uh, do you think I look, dude? <laughs> well, I, I, I just heard about it so much I've just watched it recently but let me give you the options Jack Nicholson Dennis Hopper Henry Fonda uh, Robert De Niro De Niro yeah, yeah yeah absolutely absolutely so 9 out of 10 might not bad you passed with flying cars I'll take that I'll take that yeah. <laughs> 
right um we have two minutes to go or lesser i think and before i let you go i'd like you to leave the viewers with a final word uh, what advice would you give to uh, our viewers our riders who want to